latest data on charitable giving in the United States provides a flashing yellow light for fundraisers. Hi, I'm Bill Stanjakevich. This is the first day from the Fundraising School, and I'm joined today by Eric Dauber. Eric leads a national fundraising consulting and nonprofit management firm, and he is a longtime instructor with the Fundraising School, where he also is an author within our textbook, Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, the fifth edition. And Eric, thanks for coming back with us on the Fundraising School's podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bill. It's exciting to talk about the fourth quarter of 2022 and all that's happening in philanthropy. So thanks for having me. Eric is a designer and leader of the Fundraising Effectiveness Project, a wonderful collaboration of several organizations that does the best that they can by capturing charitable giving with real-time data on a quarterly basis. And at the AFP ICON conference in New Orleans uh, back in April of 2023, the announcement was made of those fourth quarter data. Eric, what are the data telling us? Well, I think they're they're continuing what we would say is an alarming trend in traditional philanthropy for nonprofits in the United States, which is that our donor count continues to go down. What we're finding is, is that we're finding a continued reliance on major donors to carry the lion's share of giving, which of course we would expect. We expect major donors to give more. Uh, but that being said, we're finding a reduction in smaller donors across the board, which means that the future of philanthropy may be in jeopardy. And that's really a big concern for us at the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. How big of a decline in donors are the data revealing? Yeah, what we're finding is, is across the board declines. and they and they. One of the challenges we see is that uh, new organizations are bringing in fewer new donors, which means that there's fewer donors to lose every year. So every time we, we come up on another year, there's fewer donors to lose this year than there were last year because our organizations are starting out with fewer donors. And I think there's a lot of things that contribute to this. Uh, traditional philanthropy obviously is changing. Uh, people are giving in lots of different ways. So, you know, are we following these methods through our, our fundraising study is one of the challenges we have at the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. I'm really excited to announce actually that we've uh, added some new data partners to the data set that will hopefully help us answer these questions better in the future. Uh, even than we've been able to answer in the past, we've added um, Classy is gonna be joining us as a new data partner and bringing with them GoFundMe, which is a, a data partner that I'm really excited to bring on because it's a way for that people are giving outside of traditional giving circles. But to your point, uh, Bill, and it's something I think we really need to be alarmed by is, Fewer donors are giving a higher percentage of the dollars raised every year to nonprofits. Overall donor retention is now at 42.6%, which is the lowest rate on our record since we've been doing this study starting back in 2006. So this is, this is a, a real concern as we, we rely heavier and heavier on what board source would call the dependency quotient. We're becoming more and more dependent on fewer donors which makes our contributed income model more tenuous and more alarming uh, you know, year to year. We rely on fewer people to give us more of the dollars and that doesn't bode well for philanthropy of tomorrow as we potentially lose some of those larger donors to age or moving away or changing interests or changing nonprofit passions. So how can we keep our nonprofit philanthropy model strong? We've got some real work to do in terms of new donor acquisition, new donor retention, and also overall donor retention. So, Eric, what is the percent decline in donors uh, in the fourth quarter? And is that a comparison to the third quarter or comparison to the fourth quarter of 2021? Yeah, what we do in our reports is we compare year to date, year over year. So what we mean by that is when we say the fourth quarter results for 2022, we're comparing them to the fourth quarter results of 2021. And what we've found is, again, we've found declines in retention rates across sector. The one that the, one of the ones that actually alarms me the most is our repeat donor retention rate actually declined by three and a half percent. These are people who've been giving to us reliably year, for multiple years uh, in our past that are now not giving to us again. We found a little bit of a what I'll call a burp in the fourth quarter in that even major donors didn't give as much as we would have expected statistically for them to give in the fourth quarter compared to 2021. Now, the one thing I'll say is, you know, we did have some pretty large philanthropic years in 2020 and 2021 as uh, society came through COVID. So there were some growths in dollars uh, that we're still, you know, I'll, I'll say uh, benefiting from in terms of increases. Uh, so that fourth quarter increase um, in major donor giving that we might have expected statistically that didn't happen. Maybe we can make some uh, considerations for that, given all the good news that we did have in growth during COVID. 
uh, through a tough economic time and a, and a tough pandemic challenge in the United States and around the world. Uh, but again, these are these continue to be really alarming trends. I would say the information uh, is is very concerning for the sector. So a lower number of donors, a lower number of retained donors and repeat donors. What did that mean for the dollars, the amount of dollars donated in the fourth quarter compared to the year previous? Yeah, basically what we found is it's flat, kept up, you know, essentially kept up with inflation. You know, for me, what I like to look at is the trends and the general trends. Um, Methodologies will, you know, challenge us to say, is this the exact right percentage number? Did it go up or down by one or two percent? The thing that's alarming for me is that, again, this continued reliance on major donors and philanthropy being flat because, you know, essentially flat because uh, more and more donors, you know, major donors are carrying the load as opposed to fewer uh, smaller donors. So, again, you know, for me, the nuances of the data are less important than the trend lines. And the trend that is really concerning to me is the fact that we continue to have fewer people give more of the money. Uh, and that's just not likely to sustain itself. You know, one of the things I think I want to really touch on here is looking forward, jumping off these numbers. How do we how do we change this uh, dialogue? And I have no, a number of concerns. You know, here we are. It's May of 2023. We're looking at a debt limits uh, debt ceiling uh, that may be approaching in the next month. Uh, we've got rising interest rates. Uh, Jerome Powell just raised uh, interest rates by another quarter percent in the hopes of staving off. Um, both a recession, uh, but also higher inflation rates. Um, so all of these things continue to, you know, the, the S&P 500 is up by a 6% year to date, but it's expected by most analysts to be flat for the, for the remainder of the year. So as major donors look at these headwinds and look at the, the challenges of a, a portfolio that may not go up as much as it's gone in the past, as they look at their dollars not buying as much uh, in the future as they've maybe bought in the past, I have a real concern that we're relying so heavily on major donors that uh, you know if the wind comes out of the sails, uh, things things may really change for the nonprofit sector. Eric, what comparison do we have to the fourth quarter of 2019? Your point about 2020 and 2021 is is very well taken um, in that those are the two highest years on record. So if if we're going lower, we're going low from all time records in the history of the United States as long as giving USA has been measured. And, you know, if we remember back to 2019, those economic indicators you just talked about, relatively speaking, not for everybody, each person is affected differently. And we always acknowledge the challenges of our neighbors who are on those lower rungs of the economic ladder. But generally speaking, 2019, interest rates were low, inflation was low, unemployment was low, um, economic growth was not great, but solid, you know, and in the range of two and three each quarter. So, you know, if we tried to take the year 2020 and the year 2021 out of the comparison, we think, well, maybe the better apples to apples comparison is 2019. Do we have that? What are the data saying in that regard? You know, I apologize. I don't have that data handy. But the one thing I'll say is, is at the Fundraising Effectiveness Project, we're proud to be one answer in in this equation of of understanding what's happening philanthropically in the United States. One of the things that Giving USA has shown us is that, you know, the trend line for philanthropy has been uh, consistently up with few uh, with few, uh, uh, I'll say, burps uh, in the road or bumps in the road. And uh, 2019 uh, was it was up, uh, certainly from years previous, as we continue to look at the basic general trend line. And uh, we've continued to rise through 2021 and on into 2022. I'm confident then when we uh, when the Giving USA results come out next month that we'll see indicators that are probably somewhat flat uh, or maybe a little bit up. I can't wait to see the data. I don't I'm not an insider, so I don't know what it will look like. But uh, that being said, as I expect, because the stock market, you know, generally found its way upward and is generally finding its way upward, uh, that philanthropy will follow suit. Um, you know, but this year is, is again, a concern for me as we look forward because of these uh, clouds in the economic forecast, if you will, for major donors. And, you know, to your point, six out of 10 Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. I think that's one of the reasons we're, we're not getting as many uh, new donors. Uh, I think the gig economy is changing the way people work. I think that's one of the reasons traditional philanthropy is not seeing as many new donors. I think many nonprofit organizations are focusing so much on doing great major gift work that they're taking their eye off the, the, the ball of building good foundational donor bases, doing good annual fund work and annual campaign work. So I think there are lots of reasons why things are happening the way they are. 
And I think one thing I really want to draw attention to in this podcast is we have got to do a better job of saying thank you than we do of saying please. Uh, we've got to acknowledge our donors fast and professionally. We've got to thank our donors personally and sincerely and authentically. And then we've got to report back as to how the money's being used so that donors see that their investment in our communities, to quote uh, Kay Sprinkle Grace, a great colleague at the fundraising school, uh, so that they see their investment at work. And I think, I think in many cases, our nonprofits are falling short and we're seeing that impact in the numbers. Eric, you mentioned the additions of Classy and GoFundMe to the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. I know you and I both read with interest the Giving by Generations report that came out from Giving Institute, led by our uh, colleague, you know, somebody we both know and greatly respect, Rick Dunham and his company, which uh, showed a lot of different aspects associated with generational giving. The millennials are giving more. Uh, their, their giving is increasing by household compared to 2016. Same thing with Gen Z. Uh, so again, that was one of the myths busted by that study, uh, is that those younger generations are now stepping up to the giving plate, so to speak. Uh, another interesting finding was online giving. The lowest percentage of the four generations, Z, Millennial, X, and Boomer, the lowest percentage of giving online, not surprising, it was the Boomers, but it was still 61%. Uh, so meaning the other three generations, even higher percentages are now giving online with their smartphones, with their tablets, through their desktops and so forth. Uh, and interestingly, the generation that makes the most gifts every year online is the boomers, eight per year. So again, this oldest generation, another myth being busted that they don't know how to use a QR code or use their smartphone, the data don't show that which takes back to a point we've discussed with the Fundraising Effectiveness Project every time you're wonderfully with us, is how well are we capturing digital giving, especially since those are smaller gifts, and are those the smaller gifts that maybe other data collection efforts just aren't capturing yet? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I'm, I'm really excited at the Fundraising Effectiveness Project to, to have so many incredible data partners involved. I mean, we've got data partners like Donor Perfect and Kila and Neon One and Bloomerang that have been with us for a long time and who, you know, track individual contributions through electronic platforms, you know, quite capably oftentimes in their databases. With the addition of Classy and GoFundMe and also community brands, we believe that we're going to be able to broaden our understanding of digital giving and see many more of those individual gifts come in. I mean, you know, you and I have talked before, Bill, about uh, the DeMar Hamlin uh, situation with the Buffalo Bills. And the fact that here's this young man that, you know, got hit on a football field, was trying to raise $2,500 for toys and woke up, you know, with millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of gifts uh, to his GoFundMe page. Those have not been traditionally tracked through philanthropy. And we're excited by our new partnerships that we're gonna be able to bring more of that story into our understanding of giving in the United States. So it's a big challenge to track it all, but to your point, you know, digital giving continues to grow. Um, the m &R report showed, I think that online giving in a dollar percentage might've been down a little bit last year. But I think the fact of the matter is, is more and more of us are engaging in digital platforms uh, and giving gifts through digital platforms. And that's something that we can track and uh, understand in our donor giving as well as things progress. You need multi-channel outreach to donors and prospective donors, certainly in-person meetings, but also direct mail, also digital, also events, also relationships through uh, all of your internal community, every single way that you can. And Eric, again, we've talked about this before. I would say since I spoke with you last, one of my greatest disappointments was seeing a national training that said, in effect, look, basically we know the only charitable giving is for major donors. So we're going to teach you how to get to the most major donors fastest to be most efficient. And that is strictly a transactional approach to fundraising. Uh, let, let's hit our numbers, let's hit our metrics, as opposed to a transformational approach to fundraising. So I would just add as a colleague that in addition to all of your um, excellent advice today and guidance on how to use these data in terms of outreach to donors, making your case, providing stewardship, that we continue to provide opportunities. If the folks making the smaller gifts aren't making the smaller gifts, let it not be because as fundraisers, we're not asking them. Yeah, really well said. And you know, a point I wanna reiterate that you've, you've kind of talked around in your last comments is we have gotta to continue to find new donors for our organizations. If we are only cultivating and working with major donor groups, and we lose you know, retention rates at the rates we are now. You know, currently we're losing 58, basically, 57 donors out of every new every 100 we have every year. 
If we do that at a consistent rate over time, it doesn't take very many years for you to run out of donors. So our challenge as nonprofits is, is not just to operate our nonprofit organizations today for our fundraising efforts. It's important. Raising money today for our budgets is critical. But if we want our missions and visions to be vital and, and relevant going into the year's future, we've got to also be raising money for tomorrow uh, and forever. Tomorrow means cultivating uh, donors of the future, uh, many of whom might give small gifts. Uh, often wealthy people give test gifts, uh, $25, $50 gifts. And a lot of smaller donors may eventually uh, rise into wealth as their years uh, progress as well. And we won't have the, those major donor relationships when we get there uh, to make those major gifts happen. And then, of course, legacy giving. Uh, if we aren't connecting with people in deep, meaningful ways, all those legacy gifts don't happen. And there's a tremendous opportunity for wealth uh, transformation and uh, transform you know, transformation between generations coming up as well. We don't want to miss those opportunities by not building relationships across our constituencies uh, and, and on all different donor levels. If we only raise money for major donors, that's great for today, but it's not going to set us up very well for tomorrow. The fourth quarter data from the Fundraising Effectiveness Project do indeed provide a flashing yellow light for fundraisers, but not a stop sign. There's still opportunities with an abundance mentality to use your fundraising techniques effectively to be able to support your nonprofit organization. Eric, where can people find the latest report? Yeah, it's available at afpglobal.org or an easy way to get to it as well as afpfep.org. Uh, you can find our reports there for free. So we, we invite people's analysis and participation and we're also always looking for volunteers. It's a volunteer driven effort of the AFP Foundation for Philanthropy. So come help. We'd love to have you as part of the team. Well, we hope those volunteer hours are counted by the researchers when they're adding up the uh, volunteer totals because it's a significant amount of volunteer time that goes into the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. We're grateful for those data. They are instructive and informative, highly reliable, and explained to us so well by our good colleague, Eric Daubert. And of course, research data at the core of what we teach at the Fundraising School. We don't just have people who are successful fundraisers, although we do, but they don't just stand in front of the room and tell you their success stories, because until we can clone them, that's not gonna help you. So instead, we combine the effective research and data and what we're taught by those uh, results, combine that with effective practice, and teach that through our 22 public courses that lead up to four different certificates. Take one course or take a bundle that lead to a certification. We also can combine curriculum into custom training just for you. And we can do our training in person, online, in the United States, around the world, probably even up on the International Space Station if somebody were so interested, if their internet access was good up there. We also have our quarterly webinars, of course, these free weekly podcasts, and the fundraising schools work also informed by our textbook, Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, the fifth edition, of which Eric also is one of the co-authors. All of this is available on our website at philanthropy.iui.edu forward slash the Fundraising School. Thanks again to our guest, Eric Daubert. Our producers are Jennifer Boffman and Mike Anthony. I'm Bill Stanjakovich, and now you are now more fully informed on this first day from the Fundraising School. Mm -hmm.